So in this series, I'm exposing all the lies that math teachers have ever told you. And boy, do they tell a lot. Well, okay, not really, but math teachers do tend to leave things out that are too complicated to get at the point that you're trying to say. The lie that I want to talk to you about today is the angle sum of a triangle. Now, you probably know from your geometry classes that, the, that if you take the three angles in a triangle and you add up the measures of each of those three angles, if you do it in degrees, you should get 180 degrees. If you add them up in radians, you should get pi, which is the best number, by the way. But it actually turns out that that fact depends upon the geometry that you're in. And it's only true if you're in a flat space. If you're in a curved space, the angle sum of a triangle is not 180. In fact, there's two different types of situations that it can run into. But the first one that I want to talk about is probably the easiest one to understand, and that's the sphere. The sphere is a curved space. And if we want to draw a triangle on that curved space, we have to build it out of lines that are on that space. Now, if you watch my previous mathematical misconceptions video, you'll know that the lines on a sphere are actually the great circles. So when you talk about trying to draw a triangle on a sphere, you're talking about trying to draw a triangle where the sides are great circles. These are the straightest possible paths that you could draw. In fact, if you tried to draw a straight line triangle on the surface of the Earth, you'd actually draw a great circle triangle. The angle sum on that kind of triangle, it's not 180 degrees. In fact, it's even worse. It's not always the same sum. So to get at this idea, let's talk about how we could figure out what the angle sum of a triangle on the surface of a sphere is. And to understand that, we first have to introduce a shape on the surface of a sphere called a loon. Now, a loon is the intersection between two great circles. So if you take two great circles and you cross them across each other so they intersect at, say, antipodal points, right? That's where they're going to intersect. You have two intersections between these. Kind of think like an orange slice or like two longitude lines together. Now, the loon is going to be the region that is between the two great circles on either side. So a loon has both a front face and a back face. Now, we can figure out the angle that's formed by this loon by looking at the great circles at the intersection point. If you look at the tangent line of those, which, of course, go off the surface, those lines form an angle. And that's how we'll define the angle between those two great circles. That's actually the most natural way to define an angle between two great circles like that, is what angle their tangent lines form. So let's take that for a minute as that's the angle that's made by the loon. Well, it turns out then that if we draw three great circles to get our triangle, we actually create three overlapping loons, one for each vertex in the triangle. And the total sum of the loons cover the entire sphere. In fact, it covers some of it more than once. And that's going to be kind of an issue in just a minute. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to identify the area of that triangle by looking at the area of these three overlapping loons. So first, let's figure out what the area of a single loon is. So we go back to the idea of a loon and compute its area. Well, the region that it sweeps out is precisely the ratio of the angle measure that it has to 180 degrees. That's how much of the surface of the sphere that it's going to cover. So we'll do everything in radians here because everything works better with that. So we take the angle measure of the loon, you divide it by pi. Now the reason why it's divided by pi and not two pi is because remember you have a front and a back to a loon. So if you have a loon that's as wide as pi, you have the entire sphere. If you have less than that, the angle of the loon divided by pi is the ratio of the surface area of that sphere that that loon covers. If you want to find the area of that loon, you have to take that ratio, that angle measure divided by pi, and multiply that by the total surface area of a sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. So I've got my angle measure divided by pi times 4 pi r squared. That angle measure we'll call theta. So theta is the angle measure of the loon. Theta over pi times 4 pi r squared. Well, the pi's cancel. I guess somebody ate them. And what's left over is just the theta. So we get the, the area of the loon is 4 theta r squared. 
Okay, now let's go back to the three overlapping loons that form that triangle. If the angles are theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3, the total area of the three overlapping loons is going to be 4 theta 1 r squared plus 4 theta 2 r squared plus 4 theta 3 r squared. But that overcounts the whole surface of the sphere. In fact, the part that gets overcounted is the triangle that's made by the three geodesics and a copy of that triangle in the back. And in fact, each of the three loons cover both of those triangles once. So each loon has two triangle areas in it. If we want to cover the whole sphere, we only want to cover the triangle in the front and the triangle in the back one time. But since we have three loons covering both of those once, we actually have six triangles that are counted when we only want two. Right? One front, one back. That's two triangles, one counted, but each loon counts the front and the back individually. And since we have three of them, that means the front and the back are covered three times each, meaning we have six triangles covered when we add up the three loons and we only wanted two. So in order to get the surface area of the sphere out of this, we have to add up the surface area of the three loons and then subtract off four of the triangles because that's what's been overcounted. So if we take the sum of the area of the three loons, 4 theta 1 r squared, 4 theta 2 r squared, 4 theta 3 r squared, and subtract four areas of the triangle, let's use t for the area of a triangle, that's going to equal the area of the sphere itself, which is 4 pi r squared. Now if you notice, I have an equation here that has 4 everywhere. So I'm going to factor 4 out of both sides and divide it out. At that point, I have theta 1 r squared plus theta 2 r squared plus theta 3 r squared minus one triangle equals pi r squared. So if I want to find the area of the triangle, I just have to solve for t. So I'll add that t to the right-hand side and I'll subtract that pi r squared to the other side. So on the left-hand side, you'll notice everybody has an r squared. So you can factor that out and what you end up with is theta 1 plus theta 2 plus theta 3 minus pi quantity times r squared. Well, theta 1 plus theta 2 plus theta 3 is actually just the angle sum of that triangle. So let's replace that with the letter sigma. So what we have then is that the area of the triangle is equal to the angle sum of the triangle minus pi, that quantity times r squared. Well, if you actually made a triangle, then that triangle's area is necessarily positive. Well, r squared is positive because that's the radius of the sphere. So the only possible way for the product on the left-hand side, the, the angle sum minus pi times the r squared, the only way for that to be positive is if the angle sum minus pi is also strictly positive. Well, this tells us then that the angle sum of a triangle minus pi is strictly greater than zero or that the angle sum of that triangle is strictly greater than pi. Now remember, that's in radians. So in other words, the angle sum of a triangle is strictly larger than 180 degrees. So what we've just shown is that on the surface of a sphere, any triangle that you draw necessarily has more than 180 degrees in it. Now, the interesting thing about surfaces like spheres and other kinds of curvy surfaces that are smooth is that they're what we call manifolds, which means that locally they look flat. So if you go, if you zoom in really close on the surface of a sphere, it looks entirely flat. That's kind of the point. And what that really means is that the curvature is so imperceptible that it's hard to measure. And in fact, while it is true that if you had a flat portion of the surface of the earth and you drew any size triangle on it, that the angle sum of that triangle would necessarily be larger than 180 degrees, the problem is, is that the difference between 180 degrees and it would be so imperceptible when it's small that you'd probably never be able to find something that can measure it. In fact, on the surface of a sphere, we could figure out exactly how large a triangle would have to be in order to exhibit an angle sum that's even one degree larger than 180 degrees. What we want to do is we want to have our angle sum minus pi to be one degree larger. We have to convert that one degree into radians. To convert degrees into radians, we multiply by pi over 180, which is a conversion factor because pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. So in some sense, we're, we're actually multiplying by the number one, just with units. 
So one degree times pi over 180 is just pi over 180. So if we take our angle sum and subtract pi, we want to get pi over 180. So a triangle on the surface of the Earth, in order to have an angle measure that's one degree larger than 180, so to have an angle measure of 181 degrees, would have to have a surface area equal to pi over 180 times the radius of the Earth squared. Well, the radius of the Earth is about 3,958.8 miles. If we square that and multiply by pi over 180, we get about 273,529 square miles. That's roughly the size of Texas. So in order to have a triangle on the surface of the Earth that has an angle sum of 181 degrees, that triangle would have to be about the size of Texas. And if you want, try drawing a triangle in Google Maps that's about that big. And guess what? It'll be about 181 degrees in angle sum. In fact, you can see a really crazy one. If you start at the equator, anywhere on the equator, and you go straight up to the North Pole and turn 90 degrees and then follow that down back to the equator and then turn back and go along the equator. Now remember, all of those motions are going to be great circles because they're the straightest possible lines you can pick. You'll end up getting back to where you were and you'll have a triangle made of the straightest possible lines. So each edge is a geodesic you'll have a triangle that has three right angles in it and has an angle sum of 270 degrees. Pretty crazy. In fact, it turns out that some surfaces have angle sums that are less than 180 degrees. If you have a hyperbolic paraboloid and you try to draw geodesic triangles on that, the angle sums of those turn out to be less than 180 degrees. And in fact, we call these types of surfaces positive or negatively curved depending upon this. If I have a surface and it has an angle sum larger than pi for every triangle that's on it, we would call that surface positively curved. Similarly, if I have a surface where every triangle on that has an angle sum that's strictly less than 180 degrees, then we would call that surface negatively curved. And any surface where all the triangles are exactly equal to 180 degrees, that's a flat surface. So this is actually a way that you can detect curvature around you. You just have to be able to draw triangles and measure angles on really, really large scales, which is why it's kind of hard. So yeah, next time somebody asks you, what's the angle sum of a triangle? And I know you get that question down dark alleys all the time. You should say, depends on what surface you're on.